I was so excited. I almost, we started diving into this before I hit recording for episode five. Cause this is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is an episode. This is a nice, finish Dude. what you were, finish, finish what you were saying before we, before we started recording. Yeah. So this episode, even though it's a bit slower than even episode four, but to me, it's, it really, it feels like it takes the gloves off and is swinging again at, at the audience and throwing a wrench into every preconception of what you thought of some of the characters, specifically Magra. I don't want to yeah. do the spoiler just yet, but we'll get there. And I mean, I guess just diving into the beginning of it is, I would say a lot of these big budgets, TV shows nowadays kind of follow a formula. And by the fourth or fifth episode, you kind of get a feel of the direction the show's going to go and who's going to grow in what direction or who's going to portray who or something yeah. like that. Whereas this one, even the big bad at the beginning of this episode has basically forfeited all of her power by her own like doing, I guess, because she was betrayed by her people because they think she lost her way and is, what, what do they call it? Like of a broke, she's... Something um, of a broken heart. I can't remember the... Yeah, they're like ruled there by a broken heart or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the recap of this episode, there was a quote I wanted to capture because I don't think we mentioned it last time. But it was, as she killed the people who were trying to assassinate her, she says, I've decided I won't die for this city. This city will die for me. And it's like this very quintessential, like, almost metamorphosis of Queen Kane's character, where she's like, I don't care about whatever this thing, this power I had as queen. What I really want is Drilla Morell. And then you get to see at the beginning of this episode what that actually means. And it's where she called home, which is her castle, has now crumbled, and she basically killed every one of her people, or the majority of them. And I'm just yeah. like, this is insane. So it was this episode that I was like, oh, this is one of my favorite, like, villains, antagonists, because mm -hmm. she's so different. I think we've been saying this since the beginning, but in the sense of when you have this, like, royal, tyrannical, big bad character, they're usually so stuck in their kingdom or whatever, and that's, like, where their power comes from. Game of Thrones does that, too. Like, everyone wants the throne. Yep. They want to rule whatever the city's called. I can't remember, but that's, like... That's what it is, you know what I mean? But this yeah. one, you don't really see too much. They show a little bit, but you don't see too much of the respect people give her, or the power that she really has, and, like, the things she gets from the city. And before you even get, like, a clear depiction of what that is, she's like, oh, y'all are fucking with me? Okay. <laughs> the hell with it. <laughs> just yeah. literally just gets rid of them. I was just like, yo, what? <laughs> I was, it was so, to me, that was one of the most shocking things, because they really yeah. flipped that archetype, like, on its head. To just say, like, this is her power, her force, her army, and all that stuff. And she's just like, no, nah, I don't need it. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Yeah. She's like, these are just tools. And now these people are getting in my way. So, all right. I guess we'll just uh, remove them from the board. Like, I don't really need them anyways. They're, now, they're, now they're holding me back from what I actually want. And then you also get a little bit more of, like, her internal struggle that's not just driven by the, the drill and morale and the, the religious side of it. It's like, the family dynamic that you haven't got any of that where they're walking so she's like walking down this like hallway it looks like and there's these carved really intricately like carved uh masks or faces and you don't really know what they are but obviously they're important and then you kind of realize that they're the previous rulers and it looks like almost all of them were men i think i didn't yeah. i didn't check all of the the previous ones but the one she stops at and she's kind of like whispering in its ear and she's honestly pretty spiteful in like a weird roundabout way where she's like I always loved you father but even though you didn't care for me kind of thing and then she as she's walking by there's one more blank plaque basically that would yeah. have probably had her face or probably the king she would would have technically had because it seems more of like a male-centric society in some ways and the fact that she's kind of respected as a ruler is interesting and it's not explored on but i'd be curious to see like what how did she become into power which we might get into yeah judging by the ending of this episode which we're not there yet yeah, yeah yeah that is something that'll be fun to unpack especially as the show goes on because again they kind of they get her out of there pretty quick i mean it's this is the midpoint of the season episode yeah. five right 10 episodes 
nine or 10, I forget. She's already leaving, but that was a good thing that you pointed out. I didn't notice this at first, but it is, I'm pretty sure it is all men. And so it's like, well, what changed? Was it a choice? Was someone like, we should switch this up or was it like- Force of will. He only had a, yeah, or he only had a daughter. So that's what it was. But it's, it, it, there is a, a part of her character seems like she is extremely prideful. And maybe that's why, maybe it is because she's like, people were like, uh, like a, a woman as a ruler. So she like had to be a little more like into herself to yeah. kind of really take on that role. You know what I mean? Cause she wasn't given that respect that she felt that she deserved. Yeah. And so fr from birth, maybe you can, maybe we can pull on this, but from birth, she was kind of like to hell with all these people. And so it just comes back and like yeah. full circle. And she's like, okay, that's enough. And Crazy. you definitely do see that too. In situations where one group of people is, is typically not accepted in a role specifically, like military being one of the easier examples, the opposite gender to kind of pull on this dynamic. Normally you have to go even further than the hyper-masculine men would to get respected because you have to you know, signal that much more that you're yeah. part of the able to keep control or to keep preconceptions away from what people would normally think as not being a good leader slash ruler. And so I think that just fits her character a lot where she's like, oh, other people are going to doubt me? Fine. And then there, she's going to go 150% <laughs> instead of right. just the normal 100. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's really one of the coolest, I mean, she's crazy, but she's really one of the coolest written antagonists I've seen in yeah. a long time. And you had mentioned, I think, yeah, you mentioned this earlier, talking about how there's some, I mean, should we say who, who it is? Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, so, yeah, that's fine. So Marvel, like kind of how their antagonists go, they're not super dynamic. Not that they're bad, they're so interesting and the movies are fine, but they're not extremely dynamic, right? But then you have this kind of character who, just so many layers to it. Well, like you can sympathize, but then you look and you're like, I mean, she definitely is crazy. So you're like, you can see that easily. And then at the same time, like ruthless, there's yep. a lot of layers, you know what I mean? And like, there's still way more to unpack. So I won't get ahead of myself, but it's just something that gravitates you and says like, oh, this is different than what I'm expecting. It's not just this mad king or queen or whatever, who's just evil right. for the sake of it, or, you know, just out for revenge. It's this multi-layered It's like character. the it's like not leaning too hard into the trope that makes it formulaic. Kind of what I mentioned in the beginning of this. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of shows or even feature films fall into the trope of, okay, you're good guys fleshed out and dynamic, and then you create a bad guy, but the bad guy typically is more shallow and less dynamic in general. Darth Vader going to Star Wars is not really the most dynamic character, but they had a good enough character design that they didn't need to rely on a dynamic character. They, they were able to do stuff there, but if you go to the more modern representation, so I'm going to do two examples. The first one is the shallow example, which is to pull on the Red Skull from the first Captain America. Yeah. That character really didn't have a whole ton of screen time. And at least in the comic books is one of the best villains that Captain America faces. And is a really dynamic character. But when they wrote him into the film, it, it, he was more of like a, a filler piece to kind of push a narrative forward into the grand scale of things. And so then this character gets pushed down as yeah. something that's not as important. When you could, there's a right way to do it, but it's hard. As I was saying that it couldn't have been done. It's just, they just didn't pull it off in that sense. So the, the Dark Knight, the Joker that I would use as the standard here. You could still probably use Joaquin Phoenix Joker, but for different reasons. I think they're telling different stories. Yeah. And the, the reason I use the Nolan one, though, is there's a lot of subtleties in the film that give the character depth, dynamics, and then it's like pain points. Speaking of which, the, the one scene that I'm most reminded of is the magic trick scene where he meets all the mobsters. And in that scene, he has control loses control and regains the control all within like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. And you get to see like the buttons get pushed of a character that fits an archetype very much so, but is also shows like the unique intricacies of that character. When he's called a freak, you see him kind of stumble over his words and say, wait, and then he kind of reels himself yeah. back in. And then he goes back into his little spiel. And then as soon as he feels like he's losing control, he brings out his trump card, i.e. the grenades in his 
jacket and it's like no no <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm winning here <laughs> <laughs> right no, I, I love that example and what's really cool and what i love about nolan's joker specifically which is to speak on that later but todd phillips joker does really good because it it introduces this as what nolan didn't necessarily need and that's a backstory yeah. and a lot of times and there's not i guess there's nothing wrong with this because it makes sense and Backstory is important because it gives you that those sympathetic qualities and things like that to know about the character and then gives you their motivations, right? But Nolan doesn't need that with this Joker. It's very much just like, here he is. And like you said, like, oh, I'm a freak and he reacts to that. You don't know why though, but it almost doesn't matter. It just adds that layer there and it, that intrigue, like, okay, what something happened to this person to make them this extreme, like destructive nihilist, yeah. but you don't really know what he tells stories and you want to know how I got these scars. You don't know if you can believe them or not. Cause he tells, I think two or three different stories. Yeah. he um, does. <laughs> it's really, right. and those are the things that I find fun about it. Right. Those are like the lasting textures of what makes a good villain where it's like, to me, it's if you watch something one time and you've got it, like you got everything about that character, then it's, there's nothing else. This obsession of sequels in like modern blockbuster films Yep. Well, you need to write someone who's complex enough to be able to write sequels about. Right. You know, and that's the issue, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so that's just kind of why I like Queen Kane's c- character in this sense, because at every step of the way, she's not just reacting to what's happening or just driving. It's a trope of if you all the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. That's what a lot of bad guys are written, where yeah. every time they, they get thwarted, they just try to hammer it again. And right. all, it, it just falls apart because there's only so many times they can do that before it just starts looking like they're weak and misguided and then the audience turns against them whereas right. in this sense i don't think i'm turning against queen kane i almost feel bad for her i'm sympathetic because she's created this mess in a lot of ways and so the only way she sees her way out is like well fine i will just pull the plug on this whole kingdom i guess is probably the best way to put it yeah. and so she just leaves and damn it all to hell <laughs> right <laughs> literally but no i love that and you you're sympathetic but you don't know why but you know there's something troubling her almost in the same sense of the joker of nolan's joker where mm-hmm. there's something there you don't know what it is at least yet i mean this is episode five season one so i'm yes. sure that'll you know get fussed out more um but as it stands you're like there's something like haunting there's a, there's a that, driver i, I guess yeah, and it's like haunting, like to the point where she was so quick to throw away again her power because there's something more important that she cared yeah. about more. So that's also saying like this whole power thing, for whatever reason, didn't mean that much to her. Yeah, and I just I how personally much time love that. has passed? Do we know? Because Tabakta June was out for I think they said twenty, wasn't it twenty years? Yeah, so it's like or twenty like years that? of this like hunt has been going on, and yeah. it's probably been like maybe so like since they escaped from the village type thing it's mm. probably been maybe a couple days yeah i think i think a couple days is safe they don't i don't think they specify that but i don't think it's been a long period of time i think it's yeah relatively so like quick. basically since tamakta june was sent back out it's probably been about a month of time yeah in all of this things are definitely escalating at least back on her home turf so yeah clearly things have been pushed to a breaking point yeah. And last last note about Queen Kane, at least here, and what they've done nice is that if someone said, I want to do like a character study on Queen Kane, there's enough there that that would be an interesting story on its own. And that's what I love. Like you can explore yeah. that and a whole independent story from, you know, Baba Voss and that story just about her. And there's enough there that it would be interesting because that 20 year gap, someone can make a story in that gap about what she goes through and yeah. it would be pretty I, I think it would be interesting you know what i'm thinking of right now is like this whole c thing could be easily adapted into like a comic book structure a graphic novel and yeah. you could make sub stories of hey what happened to queen kane what happened to paris what happened to baba voss and his like whole family dynamic or what happened like what was drill and Morel doing right because yeah. this will be a segue into the rest of the episode because the there's two cliffhangers uh, at the end of episode four and the first one was queen kane's thing and we've hammered what that part of it home as she leaves then it cuts to this next section which is the children and baba voss are getting back the stolen supplies so like the bow 
and I think a couple of their other key essential travel items were, were taken from their camp while they were sleeping. But the big reason is that there was a pouch with something from Magra's father in it. Yeah. And so you don't know why, and you know that the children are going to get it. And Paris kind of finds Magra alone and kind of brooding, and I guess is the right way to say it. <laughs> yeah. And Paris is walking up and she's like, so I've had this thing that's been kind of bothering me since you've... <laughs> We're so quick to send people away to go get this pouch. And it's that when Drill and Merle dropped you off at our tribe and came to us, he said, be careful. And Paris took that in the most optimistic sense, at least initially. But now it's beginning to make her question why Drill and Merle would say, be careful like he, she's changing yeah. the context and saying it's not about the future, like be careful to take care of her, but more of like, be careful of her. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's, I'm like, this is really pointed. And Paris is dope for that. She's like, I wonder what this is. And I mean, there's so much mystery here, right? Of yeah, like, it's like, what are you hiding? <laughs> yeah. And like up to this point, you have no, there's nothing to really question, at least as, for the audience, you know what I mean? With Magra, you don't really question anything up until that point, you're like, okay, what's in the pouch? Like, <laughs> why is it so important? Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's cool that they kind of funnel the audience through, in a sense, but funnel the audience's mystery or questions through Paris at that point. Like Paris is asking the questions or directing the accusations, whatever you want to call them, to Magra. And that's kind of the sentiment that the audience is feeling. Yeah. So to me, that was masterful how they did that. I was like, damn. Well, because like, for me, so my entire perception of Magra as a character was... I don't think I would have ever considered to look at her with suspicion right? without Paris's scene because she doesn't strike me as someone like authoritative. She doesn't strike me as someone who is any sort of like power hungry or like lording over people in any sense at all. Mm -hmm. And it, you don't get any of that through the preceding five, four episodes, except that she cares about her children and doesn't want them to get hurt right you know right. and so i'm just like this is seems like it's coming out of left field mm -hmm. but we'll get there <laughs> yeah, even that explanation is perfect because even that like at the end of episode four it leads you to say why is she so careless in a sense to say i need that i know it's extremely dangerous i know we're being hunted we should keep moving but i need it anyway like she understands the danger they make that clear like she understands this is not smart to do this but that whatever that is is so important so it leads you to question like what is that because even in episode three she was like you know still having that the issue with them reading and stuff like that like she was still super protective but then at this point it's like she's almost cool just on caution to the wind you know so it's yeah. like that's weird like what what is that you're just curious you don't know there's nothing to root that in but you're just like what's going on yep we'll get to it there's so much to talk about with this episode yeah, <laughs> yeah. so and at this point, we're kind of jumping back with the Baba Voss, and he is explaining more of the world to the children because they've never been exposed to this. And what you're seeing is this really interesting take on people finding old plastic and reusing it. And so Baba Voss calls them scavengers. And so you start hearing and seeing like these kind of intricate wind chimes in some way that are made out of like this colorful plastic. But it seems weird, like, I, as I was watching it, because you assume, like, at this point in the show, you just assume almost every character you're going to come across is going to be blind. And so the way this, this looks is you're kind of confused, because there's a lot of color, and there's a lot of organization of said color. And so I'm like, what is going on here? Everything seems a little different. And then there's also these, like, traps that are, like, noise traps. So Hanwa goes in first. Because she like, said, I can get in and get out before anyone knows. It won't be a big deal. Which leads to this really tense scene. And you're kind of, I don't know, it's just unsettling the whole way through. But then by the end of it, because you, it kind of does a quick cut and you hear her scream. And so Baba and Kofun run in and throw caution into the wind, obviously. At that point, they make as much noise and everything. <laughs> And it, it kind of, it was not really a battle. It's more of just like a, a scuffle. 
yeah. <laughs> that's fair happens but then hanwa it, it's weird because it's like hanwa is, is the one that makes them stop which is a kind of out of character for her because you'd think that if someone was like, this is an important thing to get we don't really care about who this person is we need to just neutralize the threat and move on mm -hmm. but she's the one that makes him stop and you at least i noticed at first is there's a like a scar on this person's chest and i i guess it looks more like an eye now that i know better right i don't so what that is the same symbol that jerlyn morrell left them oh, okay that's what yeah, i thought so she, yeah yeah so she notices that and she's like oh wait so it's out of character but it's still it's still her at least at this point her primary motivation right she's trying to find jerlyn morrell she wants to get to that world or whatever it is that's her, that's everything she's doing is to get to Jerome Morrell because she thinks there's, you know, her gift of sight, higher power, all that stuff. So yeah. her surface level neutralized the threat, but interrupted by her primary motivation. Now she's like, wait, wait, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's cool. Yeah. As we're watching that scene and, and the reveal here is, you know, when she stops it, Obviously, she realizes this person who was attacking attacking them, who stole their stuff, has something to do with Jerlyn Morrell, right? Because that's why would he have that scar there? Yep. So then, you know, they go back to camp and they're conversing, trying to figure it out. I don't remember if they did a vote, but they kind of discuss like, should we trust him? Like, he might know where Jerlyn Morrell is. Like, let's let him come with us because yeah. this guy's by himself. Turns out that this guy is their half brother, is Jerlyn Morrell's son, and he can see as well, right? So, yeah, as you're explaining all the the intricate organizations and colors and stuff like that. Now it makes sense. It's like, oh, yep. okay, that's, this has to be from someone who's sighted. And even when they're fighting, you know, when he has this club, I think he uses, and he's yep. like swinging it at Kofun when they're fighting. <laughs> and you're watching this, you're like, this dude's pretty accurate for a blind man. <laughs> like, he's right. really swinging, like... He's not fighting like Baba missing. does at all. You know, like, right. he's just kind of going, he sees Target go straight at it, you know, looking for boundaries or anything like that. And I thought the interesting one was like, they were not so, at least Paris and Magra were not so quick to take this person in, even though Hanwa was the one vouching for it so much, which is really interesting to me because you'd think that this person they've respected this whole time, Jerlyn Morrell being, that if they found someone who is a relative of Jerlyn Morrell and they already have two children of Jerlyn Morrell, you'd kind of have more benefit of the doubt at least on their part, I thought there was a little bit of a disconnect there. I mean, I get that it's, like, dangerous to, to mm -hmm. in this world of, like, fending for yourself and making sure you have enough resources, adding another mouth to feed is a very difficult thing. Yeah. yeah. But this person has sight. I think that may outweigh any sort of risk <laughs> right. this person may bring, right? Because they just have so much more. And even Magra says it. She's like, we're going to be creating an army of the sighted or something like that. And I'm like... Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, so is that foreshadowing? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, that felt foreshadowing. <laughs> right. Right. No, that's, that's a good point. It is, it is what's interesting, but I think that's just how, like, they, if you remember, it's 20 years they've been isolated. It's just been them. And they've been like hiding secrets of their kids being able to see yeah. even from their village. So I think it's just, it's, it's natural, but it is coming. <laughs> like you guys are going to meet the dude. <laughs> like, you I know, know that's what I mean? what like, I was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you're trying um, to go find him. Like, don't you think he'd want to meet another son of his? Right. Like, I also thought that Baba Voss like really uncomfortable in this scene. He's like, yeah. oh, another one, huh? Right. That's a, <laughs> that's a cool, very cool thing about Baba Voss. And I think there's a point where he even, yeah, he does. So he and Magra are talking to have their kind of intimate conversation about what's to transpire and he's saying they've mentioned this again in, in earlier episodes but Baba Voss is basically saying like Kofun's fine he gets it like he understands why we do things right but he's still worried about Haniwa and I think it's because he's like I like I'm not really their father right and basically like his worry like he cares about these kids and like that's a, such a cool aspect about him like he literally cares like he is there to him he is their father right yeah and he's I think there's this like this fear of him that he's like willingly bringing his kids who he loves to their father literally only in a biological sense to their father and he knows he's going to lose them and he's trying to come to grips with that and i feel yeah. like he's like fighting against it like i don't i, I don't want to but i know i must because the greater good he knows he should but he doesn't want to because then he's giving up that part of him 
And it's a cool character arc because we don't meet him here, but where he starts, he's this ruthless, just murderous person, like when he his slaver background, but now he's turned the corner, you know, done like a 180 yeah. and has become this like caring, protective, patriarchal figure. So it's just a cool, I just, I love Baba Voss. I, I love all the characters really, but that aspect of him, it's like a soft spot, you know? Yeah, definitely. He, he, he strikes me. He's, it's not one note in any sense. Like there are so many things and some of it's even contradictory or at least it would seem contradictory, but for some reason it works in his sense. And it's like, why would you try so hard to bring your adoptive children to their father when you have felt like you've raised them this whole time? And by doing that, you give them the opportunity them to say, well, I've met my real, like I, now that I have my real dad, see you later, you know, yeah. like, it, like that goes against every instinct you have as someone who's <laughs> like a caretaker. Right. Right. But I think maybe that's, that's the thing. Since he yeah. is a caretaker, he knows they're probably safest with Jerlem. And then so. that leads to another unique scene with, between Kofun and I think it's Bo, as you say yes. her name. She's also yeah. the shadow, I believe from episode two. Yep. So yep. I thought this was really interesting. And also it says so much about Kofun. He's so naive and yeah. endearing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and it also says, I thought Bo was kind of letting her guard down in a weird way. Like she's kind of been this character that hasn't gotten a lot, but the fact that she's there, I find it interesting. Cause it, uh, to me, it, it says that she's going to have a bigger role to play as the story yeah. goes on and yeah. as it just develops, but basically because she brings it up to point blank and says, why did you hide it? Like, keep the secret that you can see this whole time. And she kind of is like, he gives like a nothing answer. And he's like, the fact that you don't realize it's a secret and that it's a big deal shows how long you've had to keep it a secret. And then she says these things about like, can I tell you what it's like to be a shadow and knowing people's thoughts? And she basically does like these quotes that almost could have been said by Hanwa or were, were said by Hanwa in a previous episode. And I was like, whoa, this is interesting. Um, and maybe in that sense, the Bo as a character is a way for Kofun to understand his sister more deeply. Because yeah. obviously when you're, you're related to someone, you can't really like ask point blank questions because you're out of respect for your family member, right? <laughs> right. Right. Or it's a way for Kofun to be, to grow up, right? As a way to become more like Baba as a protector. And because you kind of see that in most of these scenes that he's kind of protecting her or like looking out for her because he feels like, why is she with, like, he, I think he feels bad that he, she's like stuck with them out of yeah. no choice of her own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. And I think he feels bad because he's like, you, I mean, their village is gone. Like yeah. everyone's gone. I honestly so, thought she was going to say something about that. Like, oh, you kept the secret and now they're all dead. You know? <laughs> or yeah, we think, that, are, are they dead? I assume they're dead. I guess we can assume. They didn't show it. And that's one of the things I always say in TV movies. If they don't show major characters, like, actually gone, then they're not gone. That's just yeah. one thing. So, like, in anything, when it's, like, someone screams and then you don't hear from them for a while, I'm like, they're going to come back. They didn't show anything. They're going to come back. <laughs> um, so, Good point. But... So I don't know for sure. It seems. I mean, it seems. I would assume so, we'll just see. because of the way the the witch hunter operates is yeah. kind of what I would say. <laughs> right. So we'll we'll see. But I I was thinking that I was surprised because I think Bo's mom is the one who told her to go with them. So that was one thing that I was like, I'm surprised she didn't say anything about that. I wonder if that'll come up again. But that that was the thing in, in that conversation because I I kind of forgot it from the first time I watched. So watching it this time, I was like, maybe she mentions it here and then. I don't think she does. So that was that was one thing. But I do I love Bo and Kofun's dynamic. I don't know if there's a romance element there. I could see it developing. I don't think it's there right now. I think it's too soon to say that, but I could definitely yeah. see that happening. Yeah. But nonetheless, I feel like their dynamic is cool because he's like you said, he's naive. I think he's like a warm person, really caring. I think he even I'm gonna jump forward a little bit, but I won't get into it. But at, in another of the fight scenes, I feel like he's really hesitant. Like mm -hmm. he does it, but like he's not. I noticed that too. I, I, that was one of the first things right. I picked up on. Cause like you see like the ruthlessness between like Hanwa and Baba where, and even, so the Jerla Morels, their, their half brother is named Boots. Yes. Even yes. him, he has no remorse. There's like a battle scene that happens toward the end of this. And you just see this like very direct and not really like worried, I guess like compassion I, in some way, like 
Kofun has he has to kill someone and he kind of looks disgusted <laughs> yeah. when he does it. I'm like, and he and he didn't even go for like the throat like Baba would. He yeah. like stabbed this person in like the upper abdominal area. Yeah. Which it shows again, like he could easily have gone straight for the throat, but he decided not to. It shows a level of restraint you don't normally see. Or like a thoughtfulness of, okay, so how would this character fight? Yeah. Not just like, okay, there's a fight scene and everyone's going to be the lethal killer that they need to do. Because it's more real, I guess. Yeah. No, that's true. It's, I mean, it speaks to his character. He seems like he's aware his actions or his place in the world. I think it's better. I think he's aware mm -hmm. of that. And I, I might be wrong, but to me, it feels like since he has sight, it, he it's like he feels bad that he does like it's unfair right like he's like yeah. i'm gifted with this thing it's unfair and he feels guilty using it even in fighting with people who are trying to kill them even he's like this is like an unfair advantage i have yeah and and like he could let loose and he probably could like him and Haniwa, they could probably have taken out the majority of that Oh yeah, Birch they could have rolled over right? everybody, probably. Right between them, I'm, all three yeah. of those decided kids could easily probably taken out most of them just by misdirection. Right. <laughs> right, and so it's and so it's interesting how I mean I know we skipped ahead, but I, it's interesting how like when it's coming up, like you see him like kind of clutch at his knife a little bit, and he just like like you said, uncomfortable. He has mm -hmm. this like expression. So it's interesting. It's a cool touch, but I really like his character for that reason and i think it's a nice juxt it's a nice juxtaposition in a sense because the world around him is so ruthless but like yes. everyone works with this reckless i mean as we said queen kane <laughs> destroyed her whole village and like then you have this character who's like kind of clumsy in a certain way like yeah. you know what i mean in an in a emotional way in a sense and like really thoughtful and aware of where he is and he's not just like yeah let's just do whatever let's do, you know it's yeah like, it's really it's really cool like even bouncing um, back to the to when they met boots he sees him coming like the camera is pointed at and so you don't see like the boots is coming from behind the camera basically from a perspective I have to explain this so for audio reasons <laughs> but instead of like immediately jumping into action because he's uh leaning over hanwa's body he sees the person the, the person coming at him, and so he immediately pushes Baba out of the way because he knows that Baba can't react fast enough if someone's coming at them because he's blind. He can't just be, like, on your left and just, you know, immediately triangulate that. So in, in that even that situation, he's more already looking out for the people around him, more, th more so than his own safety, you know? And it, I think it says something about the character. And I, I, I think you're totally uh, spot on. Kofun's like a palate cleanser. In a lot of ways where yeah. in a world that's harsh and unforgiving he's someone who's like exemplifies restraint and compassion and doing what's like best in like inspiring and aspiring to be better than the world they're in yeah which is uh, you know it's an interesting it's an interesting thought right like in post-apocalypse stuff it's always like this gloom and cynical and you like you do what you need to do to survive type attitude and yet here's this person who's who has no blueprint to go off of other than that he's he for, for moral reasons he's not going to attempt to be a ruler i guess you know like he doesn't I, he, I feel like he has no like power trip in, in him at all yeah yeah not yet. <laughs> definitely not but yeah i mean i i think it's so this was a thing i was thinking just now on surface level, you would say Baba Voss is obviously the protagonist, correct? Mm -hmm. At least it feels that way. But I was wondering if not already, if at some point in the story's total arc, if that'll shift to Kofun. Just because I feel like they're setting him up for like such a bigger purpose. Obviously, he can see and things like that. But yeah. just how he works in this world, it just, to me, it seems like that's where it's going. Um but that's, that's, that's just speculation. But I yeah. was just curious. It might be a dual protagonist thing because of the way Hanwa and Kofun are are twins in that sense. They could there could be a way they could split that so that it yeah. it's their arc together in a summation. But given the way that Hanwa seems more predictable, even though she did kind of unpredictable things in this episode, <laughs> maybe maybe I'm I'm speaking too soon, but I could definitely see that becoming the case. It's it's an yeah. interesting it's an interesting thought because it's I think it's just rare that you there's so much to say about every the, one of these characters that have screen time. 
Like, yeah. <laughs> like normally right. what you see is what you get. And now it's like, wait a minute, there seems to be a lot more beneath the surface once you start discussing it. That's good. That's good television. That's good writing because then it feels real, right? And yeah. Obviously it's not real, but <laughs> it feels, it feels like the world actually exists. Yes. And that's the point. If you just have one higher than life character and everyone else is like paper thin, yep. and that's what it's going to feel like. You know what I mean? Yep. It's going to feel like you're watching a, an unintended character study. But here, it's like, this is a world everyone has layers, just as real people do. No <laughs> one's easily explained off. You can't explain off a person in a yeah. sentence, right? And these characters, I think they do a great job of these, all of these characters. And obviously, they highlight, you have to highlight certain ones. Right. Um, like Paris, obviously, has a little bit less. But even her, there's like an intrigue there that I'm sure will be, you know, expanded Explored. on at some point. Yeah. It just hasn't been her time yet because the central theme, they're still, you know, central themes, all this <laughs> stuff's going on. Um, and should yeah, we expand on the Queen Kane's layers, or should we just call her Kane at this point? <laughs> yeah, is she a queen anymore? Yeah. That's a cool question. That's a cool question. Is she still a queen? And they kind of, so you'll see, but even now they're exploring that, right? So I guess we can jump back to her. kind of her storyline, which I guess yeah. we can call this the, the B storyline at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Where she's now left her kingdom. It's, it's gone. So she leaves with her, that's her shadow, right? That's supposed to be the that girl. Yeah, I think her. so. Yes. She was the one that I think was spying on the counselors. The yeah, yeah, the advisors before, as they were trying to set up the assassination. I think she was the one that had basically warned her of what they were planning. She's leaving in a in a carriage with her driver and her shadow, and there, she's off to find Jorla Morel. If I'm not, I'm not yeah. wrong. Either Jorla Morel or Tamak de June, but I'm pretty sure she's like, I'm just gonna do this myself. I love this scene. I might be skipping a little bit, but I just, I love how they do this scene where she's kind of talking with her shadow, right? And, you know, that, they set up like a little camp, right? Just to like spend the night or whatever. And, you know, there's a fire lit and she's walking with her shadow. Obviously they're blind. The shadow's behind her. And you can see someone walk up, take the shadow as she's like talking. She's yelling out to the driver, driver, you know, put out the fire or whatever, the, or fix the fire because the smoke is choking it or something, she says. And no one's answering and we can see the no one's there and she's by herself but she doesn't know because what happens is there's two shadows who we don't know who they are with <laughs> they're sneaking around kill her shadow kill the driver and you made a point you're like oh i didn't know there were warriors and i'm like that's dope but i mean if you're smart and if you're a leader those are probably the best ones because they're so silent like they can get a lot done <laughs> pretty easily my comment um, was they're the 007 of this universe <laughs> yeah, um, but it, it's so i just love the way they shoot it and you guys have to see it like it's watch it's beautifully shot i think um, it's so tight you know, and claustrophobic like they don't have personal space which makes it that much more unsettling and then yeah. their art direction is mostly these characters that are covered in mud and it's like different colored so it kind of looks like they're almost like a like ghostly almost yeah like a pastel painting kind of like where it has like just a whole bunch of layers of caked on mud on their face and so you just i don't know you just get these characters that are it's such a cool way of doing like this idea of a shadow right they just blend into the world and who they are doesn't really matter and so they just make themselves as nondescript in like a a neutral earthy way <laughs> as much as possible yeah, right it's so cool but what and then she ends up getting kidnapped obviously you know and they take her and they take her away and some of her commentary <laughs> doing all of this is like she's just dope she's hilarious they have her like tied up and they're walking her she's on the horse and she's like just mad talking shit <laughs> to them it's like yo you're a prisoner right now she says a line like you know i'll be there when they slit your throats and it's funny because this is delusion right because who's they so her kingdom's gone everyone's gone the only people that are there is tamaki june and his witch hunters but we don't know how far uh, away they they are from her yeah yeah and they even, and, but then, wait they don't even know what the hell just happened either yeah that's what i was gonna say <laughs> i was like <laughs> like they don't know that their kingdom is gone <laughs> like right so but she's talking as if she still has all the power so she has this like delusion in her head <laughs> and she's talking to her, i'm like yo you should be like very <laughs> like remorseful whatever you got to do to get out of this and she's like no nah, i'm gonna talk my shit and that i love her for that like it's really like she doesn't care she's the karen of this universe yeah so then what so they it kind of cuts back. and we, we cut back, but we can kind of, they jump right back into what, where they take her. And so the shadows kind of mention that it's this, 
this place called the City of Worms, which is not really a city. <laughs> it's more of like a little bit of a ruined building, or maybe, I don't know, it might see more in the next episode of how big this place is, but you only see like maybe two, three rooms of what this place is and that it's kind of run by this slaver. And the reason it's called the City of Worms, it's this, it's a silk manufacturing place. And it's, it's just really interesting because immediately you see this person and they're like, oh, you know, like nice hands because she's got really soft hands and all this kind of stuff. And he's like feeling her jacket or dress. And it's like, oh, you must have been a noble person of some kind, right? Like he's like really close to the mark, but mm-hmm. he's he wouldn't go so far to say like, oh, wait, you must be the queen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Like you wouldn't expect that, but he's like, you're different. Something's different about you. Yeah. And that whole scene is hilarious too, because I mean, she's still kind of talking her shit at this point right Mm -hmm. like she still has this like listen to me like this royal tone authoritative i guess authoritative that's yeah correct and it's like yo that doesn't doesn't work in this place that you're at um no one's jumping to your attention anymore (laughs) right so to me what's cool here is you see in the same episode i love that they don't make you wait for this but in the same episode you see the direct consequence even though her delusion remains, but the direct consequence of what she did at the beginning of this episode or end of the last one, where she mm-hmm. got rid of her kingdom, she exposed herself to everything that's going on in the world that she's been secluded from. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And what's so cool about this is because you don't see that. Again, we talked about this already, so we don't have to go so much into it, but you don't see these rulers and kingdoms in that, in that sense you know go out into the world that they're in like this but deliberately their choice go out and then have to deal with those consequences and see what the common folk i guess you can call them have to deal with and the dangers like she just completely didn't regard that having a driver and one shadow (laughs) for protection was going to be enough out there like because it probably she didn't even comprehend the day no yeah exactly she had no clue how dangerous the world outside of her little known area of influence was so she's just like cool i'm just gonna go out into the world and go find the thing that i really want right because that's what i'm able to do at it like my whole life i've gotten everything i've desired and yet here's the one thing that i can't get and every time it's taken away from me or i don't get it fine like fuck it i have to go like then i have to be the one to go do it and now she's (laughs) seeing just how hard (laughs) right the world really is and it's, it's funny because she's still in queen mode. So I forget exactly what she says, but she's like making comments. She makes a comment to him, like they'll have your head or something like that. She keeps talking about they, and I'm like, there is really not a they anymore. <laughs> but she, I think that's what she said. They'll have your head. And he's like, interesting comment. Like you picked up on that, the slaver. Mm-hmm. And he's like, interesting comment from you. Like, I wonder, like, who are you really? You know what I mean? And he like yeah. does this thing where he like puts a rope around her neck and like tightens it. And I feel like that right there is like restraining not only her, but like her voice because it's like around her neck. So like she can no longer talk. I don't know if that was the intent. It might just be, you know, whatever. Great that, symbolism, if any, if for any other reason but that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, he's just like, it's almost like she, like now, so her, her kingdom, she crushed it. But now it's like her identity in a sense, like who she is, who she thinks she is, is like ceasing. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh shit this isn't uh, i can't work in this world the same way i used to and i thought the part where so like right after he puts that on there he kind of gives a rope to like one of the shadows it looks like a different shadow not the same one uh that we've been following the other two that were that captured her and it's basically the slave owner is walking toward the camera back the way they came and he remains in focus and queen kane is out of focus kind of struggling and stumbling and i thought that was really deliberate action in in the to showing the like crumbling of her power where she's still struggling and like fighting against the reality of what's happening and he's kind of describing like it doesn't matter what you came from you like oh we all have to start the same way and get to work and you know in here and have to gain skills and as long as you don't try to escape and just work hard you'll have a good life eventually but you're still gonna die here You know, like, like it's very ultimatum feeling. And I'm like, wow. And then it kind of cuts back to her and she's like, she doesn't pray to where you think she prays or at least 
it fits her character, but she doesn't pray yeah. to where where everyone else would have. She yeah. prays for Jerla Morel. It's like she's she's crazy. She's so <laughs> you know, far she's, gone. She's obsessed. <laughs> she's crazy. She's delusional, and it's it's really cool to see like okay, how is she gonna how is this gonna play out? Like how is she gonna work in this environment? Right. How is she gonna come to terms with her situation? Yeah. As um, someone who has been ordering people around probably her entire life right <laughs> you just assume it's not gonna go well she's not gonna adapt <laughs> seamlessly but yeah so i love i love that storyline it was completely on un- like when when i tell you i was like i did not expect this to go this way i would never have guessed that but i love it it's different it's refreshing yes you like i like seeing stuff like that right it's so complex and it opens up so many avenues for character growth because right. she to me she seems like the kind of character that i don't she's interesting enough that i don't see them getting rid of her sooner rather than later right. like there's a story to complete there right yeah. and i'm more interested to see that how how does she become a more three-dimensional character who comes to terms with the limitations she's boxed herself in around because now yeah. she's i mean she's kind of reached the point where the call to adventure like she can't go and tell order more people to go do things anymore, right? Like she reached that threshold and said, "Fine." Like if we're going to use the hero's journey idea of mm-hmm. this, she's got kind of in the in the anti-hero aspect of the hero's journey. Like she's yeah. finally reached that threshold of like, "Well, I have to go do this because it, the result I want is not coming to fruition." And now you're seeing, well, <laughs> oops. <laughs> <laughs> red so so we love that and then so from there um going the, back and the thing kinda, we've alluded to this whole time <laughs> yeah yeah so um the ending of for this episode but the a story right so mm-hmm. Baba Voss and all them they're trying to leave but they're you know they're both stuck because the tide shifted or something like that so they can't and as that's going on you start hearing dogs barking and the dogs barking symbolizes the witch hunters are close so you know so like they're starting to run you know the opposite way so they figure out they're surrounded baba Voss has paris and magra go hide while the rest of them are going to try to fight their way out of it right so the fight ensues that's what we alluded to where kofun is kind of hesitant baba Voss is doing his badass thing that he does <laughs> you know what i mean like knocking trees like this dude's just a badass like it's whenever action he, happens he just locks in he's just like all right yeah neutralized here we go we got threats like, that's to irrelevant yeah, it really is element, like he's just he's like i got this and then the, the interesting thing here is so it's like magra and paris are hiding like in a like in a trunk of a tree right and they're holding each other's hands and magra leans into paris and she whispers something and then disappears like it cuts it cuts back and magra's gone right paris calls out to baba Voss. they come and he's like they took her they took her and she's like no she let go of my hand and said be careful which is what Jerome morell said to Paris, right? Yep. Beginning. It comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, and that was just like, oh. I know. <laughs> okay. It was like the building of the mic drop. <laughs> yeah, so this part is just, it was so badass. But so, you know, we, we they, they cut to Magra and she's walking through the forest, right? Out into, you know, like a beach calling area. out to- Like a beach yeah, area. Like a, yeah, and she calls out to Tamak Dijun. She's calling out to him and you're kind of like, what? what's going on here? Yeah. Uh, so as she's walking up, you know, you made this comment and I didn't even notice this, but you noticed a shift in her voice. She had an she accent. Found, she had yeah. a, like her voice changed completely. Yeah. And so the cool thing here, I'll just touch on it. Someone, the only other time that I remember an accent being brought up in the show was the prior scene with the slaver. Okay. I was only, so I didn't even notice that when he said that, I was like, oh shit. So she's walking up into Maki June, you know, he takes out his sword, he's walking, he's like, Magra says like, do you know whose voice this is or something like that? And his response is the voice of a dead woman. I, we'll see, but I think that has two meanings. We'll talk about that next episode, right? Oh um, boy. We'll oh, talk boy. about that, but I think that, has, <laughs> I think that had two meanings, but he's, you know, getting ready to deliver the blow. He has his sword out. And as he goes to grab her, she picks up, she lifts her hand up, right? And on her hand is this, it's like a ring mm-hmm. with um, bells. jewels on it, right? Yeah. yeah, bells. And she shakes it. And the only other person who had that is Queen Kane. And he stops and they all bow to her. And I forget her, I think her name's the same, right? But like Margaret of House Kane. Yeah, he says princess at the princess. very end. And yeah, I was like, princess. I was like, what? 
<laughs> and that's how the episode ends. So it's like this crazy cliffhanger that no one would see coming, but they touched on it with the be careful. And then the accent, the slaver says that to Queen Kane. He's like, your accent is interesting. It sounds royal, is yeah. what he says. Man, that shit was dope. I never would have expected that. Not yeah. in a million years. Like, now that it's all happened, I'm, like, reanalyzing it all over again. <laughs> and like, I'm like, what was telling it away? And I, like, like, part of it's, like, st- like, subtle things about a character that I just thought were character choices. Like, the like the feathers in her hair, like, on the right side of her head, she's got, like, these kind of, like, maybe owl feathers or something. And I was like, okay, that's a little bit more ornamentish than other people in, in the cat in, in the in the tribe. And then she's like, I think the only person that was wearing uh, white robes or coats. Oh, what's she? I that's interesting. I didn't notice that. I think. I'd have to go back and check, but when she's walking up onto the beach, she has like this kind of white cloak. And if you just think about the society, if everything is kind of gone back as a restart it's much easier to have clothes that are you know brown or grays or darker in general and to get white or any other colors i mean you have to spend a lot more time and effort to get pigments or dyes or bleach in in some way so that you get white so it could be a symbol of of wealth in that sense so i'm not sure if she's the only one that wore white but i feel like just directionally it would make sense. And also, yeah. why would you care in a blind society what color you wore? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> like, who cares point. about color? <laughs> yeah. Man. But, it, I mean, it was a mic drop. It really was just like... Yeah. Because now it has, it's so many questions. She's a sister of Queen Kane, And she had children with Jerla Morell, who Queen Kane wanted to have children with yeah there's so much <laughs> there's so mm-hmm. many questions and not enough answers yeah and it's just i mean it's a perfect way i mean that's like a textbook cliffhanger because you don't see it coming <laughs> but it doesn't feel random no like it's like so now in my second watch that's what i was looking for and there are like this is my second watch right so there are mm-hmm. things that you're like okay they don't tell you anything explicitly but it's kind of like things that you don't question when you first watch that you're like well, that kind of like, like how she just appears there. Like yeah. you don't really question where she's from. You don't question why Jerla Morell is with her. But now yeah. you're looking at it, you're like, uh, yeah. well, that well, makes sense. Now <laughs> it makes me question too, is like, who was Jerla Morell? Like why, like, if if he was like part of this this kingdom, which I don't know if they say what the name of the kingdom was, but mm-hmm. like, if he's part of this kingdom, like why would, why did he leave? If he was like, you know, in bed with the royal family. Right. <laughs> this question Both literally and figuratively <laughs> <laughs> man um yeah i mean like like we said earlier this episode was a little bit more slow burn than some of the other ones but the payoff is it don't pull no punches yeah it's like but just wait just like wait there's so see. much in here that like it's a footnote that there's another sided child <laughs> yeah. yeah, literally, and that's like a big reveal too. Like, <laughs> that's like a big thing. Like, oh damn, there's more. Like, yeah, yeah. no, but just wait. Like, you won't. You'll forget about that. <laughs> like, like the fact that Jerry Morrell still got busy even after all that is like, wait, hold on, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. There's a lot. Um, this is crazy. Like, I, it's crazy to me that we still have so much to talk about. Yeah, man. It's. I mean, it's good and it's building. And like watching this, you know, on a second turn, it's like the pacing of this is great. It doesn't lull you really yes. at all. And when it starts, you start feeling that because some shows do, and that's you know that's fine. But you know, this one was like, okay, it's a little slower. It's a lot of cool stuff is happening, but like in terms of the other episodes, this was probably one of the more slow ones. And then they hit you with this, so it's like the slow episode isn't like you still got to watch it. It's still important. It's not something yeah. that just zone out. But the pacing is great, and it it really continues on this pace. I won't say too much. Else. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah it's it's man it's just it's yeah good. no complaints here for me i'm just excited to do this and i i love talking about it honestly because it's like i just spend so much time now just dissecting film in in some form or fashion at this point with my in my free time it's just fun for me to go down the rabbit hole of like okay how do we look at what makes a good story and yeah. like what makes a good story on film because what there's different criteria for a different medium right 
Yeah. And it, to me, it's just a lot of these elements, though, it, it, it really, you have less margin of error in film because you have, I mean, a time limit in yeah. in a very real sense like you only have yeah. so many minutes <laughs> to right. get your point across and if you don't nail it then your audience is going to get bored plain and simple and right. kind of like what you said with the the perfect pilot where it's like if you have to wait till six episodes in or someone has to give you like well let me give you this link to like the the core episodes to watch or whatever yeah. it's like if if the story was worth watching, then all of the necessary episodes would be there. Not yeah. like, here, let me selectively filter this thing <laughs> so that he, <laughs> it makes it the most interesting version of it, right? Like, right. it's, I don't know, it's a lot of fun. And I, I really hope that just people take a show like this. And as I'm not saying copy it. I'm saying look at it. And if you really want to be in the storytelling or film or show industry in that sense pay attention to the elements here and if you can write down the things that work for you and try to really understand those because those are the kind of things that are going to pay off in the stories that you want to watch or create down the road because i, yeah. I could truly see this kind of story being one of those that you go back to in like 20 years from now and be like oh yeah this didn't get a whole lot of like acclaim when it was first released because there's just too much <laughs> to watch. Yeah. But it'll be one of those things that you can take to heart and continue to revisit. And because it was a, a unique story, it's, it's like before we even recorded, we were talking about Dune and how like the new film, which this is just me foreshadowing a future podcast, <laughs> but how something that could be written in 1965 could be taken now in, in 2021 and translated to film finally and for all intents and purposes from reviews it's finally doing it justice right. and, and and that's and and to me it's staying true to the source material but understanding it, how to translate that to the medium in which you're trying to represent your story yeah i mean you're spot on and i guess with dune i cannot wait for that movie <laughs> i'm so excited for that movie and it's interesting because the, the original Dune film that came out in the 80s, right? Yeah, I think it was like 84. Yeah, it bombed. Like, it, it didn't, it wasn't, I don't know if it was received well. I'm sure it has a cult following for sure, but like in terms of sales and stuff. And it, it was just, I think it was ahead of its time. Very ambitious, the special effects needed and the budgets and stuff. The technology just, just objectively wasn't there, right? So I don't yeah. think you can blame those filmmakers at the time. They did the best they could with, with what the they means had. they had. Yeah. You can look at something like Star Wars and see how they had to make it work and it, they made it work, but like now you compare that to the Star Wars that were coming out now. It's just it's night and day. You know, there's I mean? no comparison. Um, like yeah. at least from like a, a technology standpoint. <laughs> right. It's still cool though. I mean, it, they did you know it did a good job, but I mean this this film it's showing how storytelling is meeting with technology and the things you can do and like camera effects, all these things like all these different elements of film kind of coming together to make something that's just it's a spectacle like doing is yeah. i call it it's a film it's a cinema but it's also a spectacle that's something you want to be in a theater imax it's huge screen it's, uh this huge <laughs> screen and loudspeakers and just be like holy shit like yeah. how do you how does someone do that you know what i mean and i think tv you can't get that necessarily because at least i might be wrong someone if you listen to this and i'm wrong correct me but i think the budgets are a lot different especially from like a dune to see Yes. C is probably a higher budget television show in terms of television, but when you go to film, it, it's completely different. Yeah. But I think what C does well can be what Dune does well if you translate that into the television world is what C is doing well. Yes. It's taking these high concepts, streamlining the main points, not rushing, but streamlining the main points, having these expertly written characters close and this this is like a cool midpoint review right because we're like midpoint through the season so it's cool but <laughs> like you know i have these characters all this key, like attention to detail that might have been overlooked in the you know television in the early 2000s or something and you just have this really in the budget and then you know they shoot on site and it's just beautiful shots a major portion of their budget was spent being on location i think that cannot be lost because if they want to try to do this on green screen with recreated sets and stuff like that, it just wouldn't work yeah, as nearly as well as it does. Yeah, it would. It would be. It'd still be a cool story, but like, 
it would just take away that aspect, you know? Yeah. But it's all coming together to make this, you know, beautiful thing that we can appreciate. And it's just, it's cool to see where things are progressing. And I think C is a show that over time, as you said, I think as time goes on, people will look at the show and say, oh, this is, it's hitting something that is, yeah. is done right. And then people are going to start pulling from and paying attention to those little details and not skipping over them because you shouldn't like don't do that to your audience like you know your audience respects that they're giving you their time yeah but it, it really is to me it's just, i mean um, i don't have critiques on this show <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> like, I really like and i analyzed stuff this is my second watch through and i'm still like i don't really have anything to say it's just it's really like massive storytelling I, I would say to me what 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 strikes me about it is it it strikes that level of sci fantasy for me like the it kind of walks the line between the two in, in a lot of ways, but it 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 feels a lot like how I felt when I was really into Lord of the Rings after I'd first watched the films and stuff like that where I just wanted to like understand all of it and like it wasn't just like go in and watch like the special effects or special edition episodes with Peter Jackson and how they created it, but also mm -hmm. like how did like get into the, the head of the people of like where did the ideas of the world come from like where, like all that extra stuff is you just want to see more i guess you know it's like okay we're it, like this story is telling us this really tight concise narrative but like let's like let's see what the rest like <laughs> what is the rest of this world like you know what i mean it's like all of that extra that you, you it's it just feels like it's a, a vastness that is yet to be explored in a lot of ways yeah yeah you're spot on so I guess this would be a cool since it's mid season, right? Mm -hmm. We got the second half coming up. It sounds like a football game, but <laughs> second <laughs> half, second half coming up. Where, where and this is on the spot, but where would you rank this show currently, based on what you've seen so far? Where would you rank it in like your favorite shows, or like if you want to do like a out of ten, you know, what are you thinking? Damn, it's got to be within my top five at this point for sure just from like a storytelling and choreography and like all the things that I enjoy from a TV show. And then just like the, because I've gained so much more knowledge in like the last couple of months of doing this and thinking about it in this level. And then also my own exploration with understanding the, what it takes to create these kinds of things that I've, I've gained a deeper appreciation. And just to kind of put that in perspective, like shows that I would put an, like in the same realm of this would be the Daredevil seasons on Netflix. Even Punisher would go into this uh, as well from like a, the same like caliber of TV show. Mm. I would even put probably season one and two of Westworld. Not to say that three is not as good. I think the story just evolves in a different way that just is, it's not as magical as season one was as a show. And then I would say, Partly Game of Thrones fits this, but I don't know if Game of Thrones anymore is pro probably not top five just because mm -hmm. I think it lost some of its luster as the story yeah. went on. And kind of what we were mm -hmm. saying even before we recorded this is that Game of Thrones had episodes that were very paced, like narrative exposition. It was boring. Like you go through the episode and like, well, what happened here? And like, what was the point of the story kind of thing? And you, you just kind of be out of it. And you're like, well, that kind of sucked. A little you know what i mean you just didn't feel rewarded yeah. for it right. whereas like see i feel rewarded for every episode that i watch and then i'm excited to continue watching and and, and that's a, i think a, a hard thing to to manage in a in a show is to yeah. like get someone hooked every episode right yeah binge worthy tv that's what you need i mean yeah that's what streaming begs for yeah yeah i, I think you're spot on yeah, you're spot on with that. Game of Thrones is something. It's it's, it's something that I say is top five for me, but I agree, it lost steam. Yeah, everyone that's watched it, I think, agrees. <laughs> but, I think it's just because of the way the climax was done that it just kind of soured perceptions so badly that I think that yeah. hang like it hangs over the whole thing at this point, even though it's done masterfully in a lot of ways. Like it wouldn't yeah. have gotten as big as it did. <laughs> right. But oh, yes, it was great. They did. I mean, even yeah. the bad season, the bad season, it was still good. Right. It was just in what you expected, it was a letdown. But it was right. still in terms of TV as a whole, it's still really good. Like it's exactly. Oh, so that that's all it is. But yeah, yeah. No, see for me is I mean, granted, I've I've watched the whole season, but I would say this is 
tied for number two. Okay. Number one being of all TV shows. Number one, obviously, being Breaking Bad. I don't know if anything. <laughs> I don't. I say it so much. I don't know if anything will ever beat that. That might. I don't know. It might we just need, been like we need people in the thing. comments. If you want us to do anything with Breaking Bad, you guys got to start commenting because yeah. You like if we if you really want us to do this because he's mentioned it so many times, <laughs> and we haven't gotten around to it. So you know if you comment in any form, <laughs> yeah. do we do Breaking Bad? And then you, let us know what you want to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I'm I'm happy to do it. I'll watch. I'm gonna watch it again soon. It's on. It's like on the top of my mind. I'm like I should watch other stuff. But so I'm not. I won't be mad. <laughs> so. He definitely won't be mad. But if he gets yeah. to talk about it in the deep level, he'll he'll be even more excited to do it. <laughs> oh man, you got me. Uh, you actually got me a book. <laughs> Yeah, the the making of or like a yeah yeah it was it was something I'm pretty sure with, you bought that book for me probably <laughs> sure it was probably for Christmas yeah. it's uh, one, a couple yeah. of years ago yeah but it's like a like a breakdown of each episode of Breaking Bad it's really cool so yeah I would be happy to do that yeah that's yeah. awesome would you have any other uh, shows in your top five what is it tied um, with um so yeah so this as of right now is tied with Handmaid's Tale um on Hulu that's another a really, that's, that's, another book turned movie yeah tv show margaret atwood yep. did i get them oh yeah so that's it's it's heavy that's heavy stuff Very. so it's not something if you're trying to be in a good mood it's also dystopian as hell <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's a de it's a depressing show but it's really well written um i'm blanking on her name and i don't know why elizabeth moss is an amazing yes. actress like cool. i mean everyone is but she kind of blows me away with her performances um that's so that's tied for number two so it'd be Breaking Bad, C, Handmaid. So number four would be, I think number four, I think four is Game of Thrones. It's, it's mm -hmm. Game of Thrones is good. It's really good. Five, it's probably The Office. Completely different. Interesting. I would not have expected yeah. you to say Office is top five. That's it. Yeah, it's, I never thought it was, but I've rewatched The Office so many times and I enjoy it yeah. just as much as the time before that I'm like, it, like it's not up to me at this point. It's like it just yeah. is one of my favorite shows. You know what I mean? Like you can do good. comedy like that without like you, you have to really strike a nerve for the comedy of something like The Office. Like it has to be really yeah. in tune with itself and the the cultural context yeah. of, of why it was written. I mean, The Office would be a very interesting one to talk about because it's it's not it doesn't take itself serious, right? <laughs> Compared right. to what everything we else we were talking about. I would definitely agree with you, especially seeing like my parents watch some of the office and and find it just as funny i'm like huh like it's something special goes on there when it transcends the generational tastes and opinions yeah you know where the jokes still land it's like yeah. what is going on there <laughs> it's it's just really it's really good and it, and like when it gets touching it really touches you like yeah. it's really it's, it can be really heartfelt too and that's what it's just it's good it's just really i thought good. the evolution so be... of that show was interesting because like yeah to me it felt like the characters were kind of written plainly and like a little amorphous mm -hmm. and then as the characters found themselves which also means the actors they added more to it yeah that couldn't have happened otherwise yeah i mean it's 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 up there it, it traditionally i'm more of like a drama like i do like my heavier shows so it's yeah it's the it's the, the outcast you both. of the group yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely the outcast of the group but i mean it's 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 great when people say they don't like it i'm like just keep trying it because it took me a lot of time to watch it too not a lot but like up until i said okay i'm gonna watch it from episode one and then i was like oh this is hilarious like yeah. but just blindly picking an episode if you don't know who the characters are and starting at like episode five like yeah. the, the humor like it's kind of like building <laughs> you know what i mean I so totally you're kind of just like you're like well it's not that funny i'm like it is it just it doesn't make sense it's like watching like a like a, a stand-up comedy uh, I won't go there. I stand up comedy. I was going to bring up Dave Chappelle, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but, that'll be, that'll um, be for a separate conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but like tuning in in the last 15 minutes and then saying it's not funny yep. or something. It's like, well, just watch the whole thing and then make an opinion. But it's like I you're digress. making friends in a lot of ways. Like you, yeah. you get, to, you have to know the different people and all their different like backstories and some, and the experiences they had to let lead up to the different things that they say. Like you can't just yeah. jump into like episode or season five, episode ten, and be like, yeah. "I'm gonna get this," right? Because you, <laughs> right. you're just not. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's still a show. There's <laughs> still a point to this. You're like, yeah, it's dope. I'm 
I'm excited to see where this goes. I mean, this has been one of those things that's really fun to just kind of like exercise this muscle of being able to take the different things I'm reading or watching and apply it to a show, like a singular show and keep it a little bit more focused on right. what each episode has to entail. And it just makes it more fun for me to, you know, keep sharpening the tools, right? <laughs> Outside right. of watching this show. So right. we've alluded to a lot in this episode. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, uh, we'll pick it up with episode six next week. It may right. either be, maybe the, maybe another episode or it might be the Dune episode. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. It'll be fun. Can't wait to see Dune. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's gonna be dope. So many good, so much good TV and movies have been coming out now that we're kind of like through the worst of COVID and re-emerging into the into regular life and holiday season. I'm I'm so excited. We might have to do a pop culture one with the Spider Man, depending on how good it is. That might be yeah. one worth. That might be one worth doing. <laughs> we should. We should. That'd be. That'd be interesting. Because there's a lot there. There's it seems like there's there. a lot of rumors, and I'm hoping that some of the rumors are true, and it would make it a lot of interesting stuff to talk about there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm definitely interested. Whether it's true or not, it's like it's yeah. piqued my interest. At the, At the very, very least, least, it's it's worth talking about because of what we alluded to with the bad guy stuff. Because mm -hmm. those are confirmed at least. Yeah. All of the previous bad guys from almost every uh, Spider-Man film to date is going to be appearing yeah. in this new film and so i'm excited to talk about that aspect of the show at least right that, <laughs> i mean it's kind of dope that the, this is okay i'll keep it quick sorry <laughs> but this is what i'm saying like when when you have your producers or the people who make the decisions listening to the people the, the people who are this is for the audience you know the fans when they start listening and saying like people have been talking about multiverse and all this stuff for fucking years man and so finally finally someone's like why don't we do that? Like, why wouldn't we do that? It's, yeah, dude, like, thank you to them, to all those people who made that decision, that greenlit, that script, yes. who said, let's do it. That's, to me, it's dope, and it's a service, and it's showing that there isn't a disconnect, or that disconnect is closing. Yeah. And, like, there's starting to be a connection between people listening to the audience and giving them what they want, instead of, no, this is what we're doing. Like, for what? You're doing it for us. <laughs> You're doing it for the audience, right. so. Yeah, uh, I'll keep, yeah, I'll make that short, but it's dope. So a lot of stuff coming out. It's going to be really good. All righty. As always, leave your comments. Let us know what you're thinking or what you may have caught and we didn't bring up because there's clearly more than enough to, <laughs> to talk about. So it'd be really cool to see what you have to say and we'll bring it up and I hope you're watching. I know that Jordan, we shared a clip of this and that you had a comment of someone who started watching because of these episodes, which is Honestly, that's what it's all about is sharing great art and hoping that other people experience it and take away at least something. And maybe if you don't like it, fine, but you know, teach their own, right? Everyone has their own taste and you don't know until you sit down Very and watch right. it. So yeah. <laughs> that's the whole goal of this. And, you know, tune in on the story because it's a story we all watch, but we all have an experience is worth sharing. So till the next episode and thank you all for listening and see you all later.